Okay. Ready? Good, good. So, um, welcome everyone back in the main track of room A with an um, incredible opportunity to meet a person that you most probably run called by and actually somebody who wrote an important parts of the Linux kernel that in this very moment enable the streaming work on some of your mobile phones and uh, any other applications. So it is again with great pleasure to introduce Stephen Rosler who is going to talk about the side effects of the <laughs> spectrum mitigation and um, a, technic a technical specifics of how this was approached and what it takes to mitigate a hardware problem that is so important and uh, so omnipresent that basically every device that runs an Intel CPU recent one is um, uh, prone to attacks. So uh, I would like you to make a very warm welcome for a very important person today, Steve Rosted. Okay. Thank you very much for a um, nice uh, introduction. Uh, again, uh, Steve Rosted, I currently work for VMware. Uh, I started my first kernel development was in 98, going for my master's. Uh, my first professional work on working on Linux kernel was in 2001 with the TimeSys kernel uh, porting their Linux uh, real-time kernel to the various architectures. I then worked 10 years at Red Hat and I'm back at, now I'm at VMware for the last three years. Um, my claim to fame is the, the real-time patch, so, which is about hopefully make it into mainline soon. I, I, among a few others, were the original developers for making Linux into a real-time operating system. Uh, among that, I also became, uh, in, I created Ftrace, which is the official Linux kernel tracer of the Linux kernel, or official tracer of the Linux kernel. Uh, I have code all over the place inside the kernel, so that's true. So yes, my code, if you're running an Android phone, you're running some of my code. Um, before I go on, I have a tradition I always do in all my talks, which is I love to do selfies, but I used to do self. I, my first selfie I ever did was in um, 1984 with those little uh, yellow throw disposable cameras that you go crank, 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 take a picture, and then three months later after you send your film away, you get to see what it is. So that's what I started with. And so I don't, this is what you use a real selfie with. It's not, it's almost, I want to get some real film camera, but I'll, I'll go with this, but he knows, smile everyone. There you go. Anyway, so let's get on. Now, this talk I'm giving today, I, it's about what happened earlier this year, March, May, March timeframe. Uh, I was, we were talking about some code and uh, Linus didn't like what the approaches we did and I came out, it was several of us having this argument with Linus and the thread went on quite along, and somewhat, someone from the Linux Foundation, uh, Shua Khan, who's a fellow at the Linux Foundation, she's also a kernel developer, she was CC'd on this, and she said, Steve, this is a great topic. Come give a talk at the Open Source Summit in North America about it. So I said, sure, and I waited to the last minute, of course, to write it up, which I finally did, and I really wasn't thinking much, and I gave, the title I gave was um, Problems Emulating uh, Function Calls from the N3 Breakpoint in the kernel and the crappy solutions we came up with. I just realized that that talk was a, it ended up being an awesome talk, but the title was so boring, people fell asleep before they got to the end of it. And when I was asked to give a talk here, I wanted to give this talk again, because I think it's a really great talk because it covers, you could be really, you don't have to know anything about Linux kernel, or as long as you have an idea about programming, you could understand this talk. But also if you're really um, deep and you're a major kernel developer and you know everything about it, you'll learn something from this talk as well. So this is a wide range talk. That's why I think it's perfect here. So that's why instead I changed the title to just arguing with Linus Travals. This, okay, who here, I want to see who here does not know what this is. Hey, raise your hands, does not know what this. These are symbols for Spectre and Meltdown. Okay, who has not heard of Spectre and Meltdown? Well, in January of 2018, so I had it on my slide, so I was thinking it was this year for some reason, 
Spectre or Meltdown were announced in the public. In actuality, it was discovered in the summer of 2017, and it went through a whole bunch of things, and it uh, wasn't until 2018 that we got to even know about it. I mean, there was, there was a lot of speculation on what the problem was going to be, and these are hardware bugs. They're not software bugs, they're hardware bugs. What does that mean? It doesn't matter what software you're running. If you're running Windows, Linux, Mac, you're affected by these because it's a hardware bug. And I'm more talking about, I'm not going to talk about Meltdown, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about Spectre. And I'm not going to really go into the true details of it. Uh, that's because at Linux Kernel Recipes in 2018, um, Paolo Bonzini gave an awesome talk, and it's online. So if you go to kernel-recipes.org, kernel in fact, I'll post these slides somewhere. It does have the, the link to where to get to this talk. He goes into the details about uh, the Intel architecture th uh, that describes why this is a problem. Basically, all you have to know is that memory is slow and the CPU is fast. And there's something they call the cache in between. And a cache... Can't, you can't cache all memory, it only caches, you only cache part of the memory. So you try to use uh, the memory that you're going to use the most, pulls in the cache. As the CPU is, the engine's calculating, it will look ahead, it will, what we call speculate, to see where is it going and try to pull in the memory before the calculation algorithm or engine gets there. And what happens is the logic, since it's not calculating, it's making several guesses. It's speculating which way it will go. And by these speculations, you, what we've learned is you could actually get past uh, various checks. Like if you have a check that this person does, is not allowed to do something, that you don't go this way, you could fool the speculation to say, no, I have permission to go this way and go that way. And then you can modify the cache. So, when the engine gets there and sees, oh no, we speculated wrong, it flushes everything out and goes the other way. But it doesn't reset the cache, which means you have this thing called a side channel tack, where you could just go into your, you could allocate huge parts of memory and then train how the speculation will go. And I'm not going to go into the details about that. This is talked about, the, about this, these talks. And then what happens is you run the system call and it will speculate incorrectly, and then what you do is you just read the cache, or read the memory, and you time, okay, I read this, read this, read this, and it'll be slow, 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 fast, slow, 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 fast, slow, slow, slow. Every time it was fast, you know that the cache pulled in, and now you can determine, oh wait, this jumped here, and it will only jump, so basically, let's say you have an array of 256 cache lines, and your array, or you, want, you could find a way to speculate on some password. And you go to the first character, and based off of what that first character is, you're going to jump into this array and read some data. That's, this array happens to be in your memory space. So the speculation goes in and does all this work that the kernel will never let you do. But the CPU will do it for you. And then you go in, and it will read, say, based off of this character, say A, which is ASCII, just, I don't know, it's 60. So in your array, 60 it will go and read that spot of your array. And now, after you run the code into the kernel and it doesn't do anything, all you do is go back, read your array, and when that, the 60th element goes fast, you know that password starts with an A. And then you go to the next letter, next letter, next letter. So you could read anything in memory by teaching your system of speculation. David Woodhouse then gave a talk about how we stop this. There's lots of tricks that the software has to do. Uh, there used to be a joke when I worked at Lockheed Martin, I used to work at Lockheed Martin too. Uh, when I worked at Lockheed Martin, we used to say software was made to fix the hardware. And today, we still say the same thing. He gives a great talk about how the Linux kernel mitigates all these issues. He showed this slide called Retpolines. How many people have ever heard of a Retpoline? Okay, a few hands. Okay, don't worry if you don't know what it is. You'll learn today what a Retpoline is. Because I, I knew of Retpolines, I kind of had an idea, but once he showed me this slide, don't worry about the slide now, I'll talk about it later, uh, I went, oh crap, this affects my code, big time. And I'll get back to this. <clears throat> By the way, like I said, if there's something I say that you don't understand, just get the gist of it, just get the idea of it, don't have to know everything, this is just more of a fun. So, what does all this mean? It means dynamic functions have overhead. 
If this is your thought right now in your head, you're keeping up just fine. Normal C, okay, how many people are programmers here? Most people, yay, good. So all of you should know what programming is. And <clears throat> so this, were, this is probably a very common thing, hello world. So then we have something called a, what I call either dynamic, dynamic fun I call them dynamic functions, but they're function pointers or indirect calls, all the same thing. Q sort. This is a you know, quick sort algorithm in the glibc library that you don't want to, everyone, you know, you learn how to write qsort, but honestly, right now, today, if someone asked me to write qsort, I wouldn't remember how to write it. I, I just know there's a library that does it, and I know that's fast. I just use someone else's algorithm. I have things I have to work about that I, I have other things to worry about. So I just always use qsort. The thing I want to talk about is that compare function. That compare function is what, is that what I call a function pointer or a dynamic function. So why do we have dynamic functions? The same thing with qsort. You have, say, two arrays, and you have one function that could sort two different arrays, one of integers, one of strings. Obviously, they're not going to be compared the same way. So you have to tell qsort how you're going to compare these. So you write two string functions. You write two functions. One is called int compare, one is called s compare. Can't use string compare directly. That's because the, uh, the way that what's passed in are, are uh, the addresses of the strings, not the strings themselves, so you have to put in a wrapper around string compare. So those are the two things you have to, um, that I care about. Now, if I was to write a sort, so if I had one with numbers and one with uh, strings, and I would write my int compare, my s compare, this is just showing it, we don't have to get into the details of this, and then I go look at qsort, and I look at the source code, by the way, because open source, it's great. You could download the source code, the you know, glibc library, and look at the code. And basically, this is what I did for the talk. And I kind of pulled in, and I found exactly where uh, the qsort's implemented. And ideally, it's this function right here. You have the pointer, and you, have, you see the function is being called. That's whatever I passed in is going to be called inside. So if I pass in in compare, it's like I just had in compare in the code. And if I pass in s compare, it's like I have s compare in the code. But again, this is a function pointer. It's not a hard coded, it's not a direct function call. And this is a big difference. And it matters for rep points. So let's look at, let's do our own little function call. And I, I just say, let's go, I created a function called Goldilocks that you pass in a bed. And the bed function will take one parameter, and that parameter is going to be 23. But it could be anything I wanted. So the first one is minus 3 will be minus 3 is blah. The next one's plus 4. The next one is A is just right. And then I call that same function over again. You could cut and paste this, put it in, and compile it. It should work. And if I run the code, you get this. Minus 3 is 20, 4 is 27, 23 is perfect. OK. One of my talks a while ago, I did. I had something, and I was told that it was inappropriate for him, and they said, I don't want, I, you should have warned me first. So the next following slides might be inappropriate for some members of the audience. They contain assembly. <laughs> You've been warned. OK. I take the dynamic function, and I, um, com I Compile it, and then I do objdump, and I look at the code itself. So the first thing it does is it subtract 8 of the stack pointer. I don't even know why it's doing that. OK, it's giving a buffer on the stack pointer for some reason, whether or not I need it or not. I don't know. The RDI, I know, is the first parameter. The register RDI is what the, it gets passed into the first parameter. And then I move hex value 17, which hex is 23, into EDI. Why is it RDI, EDI? Does anyone know why it's not RDI again? Well, I'm not going to, I'll tell you right now because I want to get going. It's because it's an integer. It's only 32-bit. EDI is 32-bit, RDI is 64-bit. This is x86-64 machine. So I passed it, it takes the RDI, which is a, um, uh, took, for some reason, it took a 64-bit, uh, uh, and then it's converting it to a 32-bit, and then it's calling, it calls, RAX, whatever's in RAX, because remember, the first parameter gets put into the second parameter. Avoid pointer 64-bit. That's why it's RDI. It goes into, this, into R, uh, RAX. And then from here, I call what's in RD, RAX, and then I uh, put the stack back in return. So down at the bottom, you saw a call Goldilocks. That's a single command 
and it jumps to Goldilocks. That's called a direct function call. If you look at it, if I dis dis disassemble this and actually look at the, uh, the machine code, there'll be a hard-coded address that takes you right to Goldilocks. The call RAX is called an indirect function call. And, or, and what this is doing, it's calling something that's inside a register. So whatever RAX is, it's going to call. You don't know. The CPU can't know what it is. This is the problem with where replanes solve. Remember I said, talked about how you could train uh, the code? You can train. One of the things that the code does is on indirect calls, it, it will cache what's in this call. The first time it runs something, it'll say, oh, it's going to call here. Well, you could, since the call, it won't memorize the entire uh, code base. It only remembers a section. So some calls are going to be mapped with other calls. So if you know where in the kernel one call is, you could actually map it into user space and train the caller to jump to a specific spot, then call into the kernel, and then you could make, you could teach, you could have the speculation jump anywhere you want, including user code or to user space code. So speculate, this is why this is so dangerous to have these available. So we have to stop that. This brings us to that slide. And when I saw this slide at Kernel Recipes, it freaked me out because this is where I said, oh my God, this is going to kill performance. Let's go back to Goldilocks. We have our call there. This is compiled without replanes. I enabled replanes, which is a GCC option to enable replanes. And this is what Goldilocks looks like. This is what happens. That simple call, there's no indirect call here. The first call from Repoline, it calls this Repoline Thunk RAX, which is a single trampoline. What a trampoline happens to be is just some code you inject that usually is not part of the C code. It's just some assembly code you're going to inject somewhere that you jump to to help you out later on. So if you hear me use the term trampoline, all it means is some code that was written in assembly puts or some place that we could jump to. So GCC creates a, uh, this Repoline Thunk REX and it has a Repoline Thunk RDX and a bunch of registers and it places it here. So everything that, call, that had REX as a call, it would jump to this, repo, this, this little trampoline to do it. It's a direct call. The, the speculations would come in and jump into this. The first thing it does in that trampoline is it calls set up target, which jumps down below. And if you look at it, if the call, the way a call does, a call does two things. A call will push the return address onto the stack, and then it will jump to the locate, move the instruction pointer to the location you want to go to. The return will pop whatever was on the stack and jump, and, and jump to whatever location that was. Returns have issues too. But let's just worry about this one thing at a time. Anyway, what the speculation is going to do when it reads this, it doesn't know about this little trick. You see that move right there at the, uh, I think I use this, right? The move right here is, put, is basically taking RA, whatever's in RAX, remember we put seven, um, sorry, where's the RAX? Called here, we put the RDI, RDI, which was my function pointer into RAX, called this repeline, RAX right here, we put into the stack pointer. We just overwrote the return address. And then we called return. Now the, the speculation code doesn't know about these, it's like I said, it's not doing mathematical stuff, it's just speculating. Calls are special, it knows what a call is, it knows that it's going to be pushing whatever's on the stack and it will come back. So the speculation thinks it's going to go back up to that capture speculation part. So the speculation, when the CPU goes through and speculates, it's always going to go to that capture speculation. And then what that does at LFENS is basically flush everything. So speculation stops right here which means that every time we have a call replane, we slow down the CPU because we're not speculating which way it's going. We're basically telling the CPU, stop your speculation right here and don't do anything else. So that's going to stall the CPU. Every time, the, um, if you have a function that's going there, doing this and it's going down, it's going to kill the performance. The CPU is not going to be fetching anything. Once it hits that little replane stop, we trick the CPU into stopping right there and then, we're, then we have to redo everything, uh, wait for the memory to come back in and all that. What does this mean? Dynamic function calls have our overhead. My code, which I'm the uh, uh, ftrace, the official Linux like, tracer, or uh, uh, sorry, the official tracer of the Linux kernel, I have this all over the place. 
I have this call. This is a snapshot of what's in the code. It's messy, just look at that. That is a uh, dynamic function call. And it's all over the place, I ha have this. And I went, oh crap. I, but the thing is, what's lovely about tracing is the fact that it doesn't change much. You, either turn it, you manually turn it on, you manually turn it off. So, what does this mean again? I did some measurements to make, this is the actual first thing, telling you what I did. I ran Hackbench with and without it. So, with, with, so I basically ran Hackbench with tracing, then I ran Hackbench without tracing, then I turned on Repolines, ran Hackbench with tracing, and then turned off without chain. So what, I did the comparisons here. So without uh, Repolines versus no Repolines, with no events, which means that this is actually, I'm not tracing, this is just the overhead of Repolines that is going to affect you no matter where you are, it caused 4% overhead. So Hackbench is just this little stre CPU stress test. It's not anything big. But when I ran this, it caused a 4% overhead uh, rep running rep points. When I turn on events, it caused a 14% overhead. 10% more than what I would expect. So how can I fix this? I need to get rid of the uh, indirect function calls or indirect pointers. But like I said, this doesn't happen often. Like I said, a user enables tracing and disables tracing. This isn't something that's done a thousand times a minute, so I could do something big. The function tracer, which is another tracer within the, uh, F, which basically ftrace has been named after, which also turns no ops into calls, and it does dynamic changes as well of the code. And it can do this because it doesn't do it all the time, here or there. So you see where I'm going with this? If we have this, instead of putting in a repline, what if we put in this? Just call some function directly. And then when we want to change it, we just change it to something else. Now how does this work? We do it for function tracing. We d and it happens with um, breakpoints. And I'll explain that right now. So when you compile your kernel, the way function tracing works is we add two options in the GCC compile line. We add a dash PG and a dash MF entry. And what that does is it puts in a special code at the beginning, a, bit, a special call at the beginning of every function in, your, in the kernel. And then at boot up, we convert it into a no op. So that way there's no overhead. There's five bytes there. There's a five, basically a five byte buffer at the beginning of every single function. And that is reserved so we can modify that into a call if we want to trace it or do something else with it. So the first thing I do is I, we put in it, we replace the first byte with a breakpoint. Okay, a breakpoint is something you're familiar with if you ever use GDB and you put in your breakpoints. And this is how GDB does it. It uses ptrace and goes in and actually puts in this CC in, on x86, and this is x86 terminology, obviously on other architectures, there's different ways of doing this. It will put in CC and when the code hits this, it causes an exception, goes into the kernel, and the kernel will say, okay, we hit a breakpoint, what do we do with it? Is either the user space did it or the kernel did it. So there's kernel code or user space code. So this is what we do in code. So once we have this breakpoint in uh, ftrace for converting, to convert this to, from no op to a function player, we could hide the system. Because if we just change, just go ahead and just change the code without having the CPU skip it, if we change the code on one CPU and another CPU executes it, I'm not going to go into the details why, I've been talked before, but it can crash the kernel. So we have to make sure all the CPUs don't see us modifying this. So we put in a little breakpoint, we change the code, and then we remove the breakpoint with a new thing, and we are able to uh, modify running code. And I gave a talk about this before, in fact, at the kernel recipes this year. You can watch that. So how does this work? When we hit the breakpoint, it causes an exception. What, what the exception just means is that the CPU is going along, and we hit the breakpoint, the CPU is going to switch mode, jump into the kernel, and jump into a vector and call another kind of a trampoline, and says, what do we do with this? Well, we have a handler. We have an do in three handler inside the kernel. And inside this kernel, I mean, this is an overly simplified version of it, uh, it will store all the registers of that. Of the, so basically, registers are the state of your code. As you're running, your application's running, the registers are happening. When interrupts happen, everything else, we just store all the registers because that's the state of your, the processor. And do whatever we want. Then we restore the registers and go back. 
but we are, the interrupt handler or the exception handler is given a pointer to the state. So what we do here is we, the IP is the instruction pointer, and we add five to it. Remember, it was five bytes? And then we return, and it returns past it, so we actually never execute the code. So basically, we just emulated a no-op. No matter what was there, we're able to emulate a no-op, and the, uh, the kernel is all happy about that. This is great when you're going from function to no-op and from no-op to call function. By emulating a no-op, you're emulating one of the states of the transition back or forth. So when you're going on a function, if you say, I want to make it a no-op, and you put the breakpoint in, you just automatically went to the next state. We don't care. Or if you're in a no-op and we want to make a function, you put the no-op no -op or the breakpoint in, you're emulating no-op, you're keeping the same state, and when you return back, you've switched to the next state. All that works. Because the no-op is part of the state transition. But what happens if we want to go from calling foo to calling bar? There's no no-op there. So if we were to do this, if we're calling foo and we have to switch to calling bar by emulate, by putting uh, instruction pointer five points or uh, five away and then coming back, it doesn't work. So what we must do is emulate a function call from that in three handler. And this is where the fun begins. Because a call doesn't do one thing, it does two things. I told you earlier, it pushes the return address onto the stack and then changes the instruction pointer to go to where you're calling. And the return does the opposite. It pops from the stack and goes. So we need to emulate, to emulate the function call, we need to push the return on the stack. And that's where things get tricky. So this is why. When we're running and we hit that in three, remember I told you that we save state? Well, we save a bunch of state on the stack. Before we ever get to the in three, the hardware will put in the stack, uh, the stack segment, the stack pointer, the flags, all your flags will be done, like you know, all the state of your flags, so you know whether or not you have a compare, you do compares, those are flags, that's all stored. It'll tell you the code segment and the instruction pointer is all saved. The hardware does this. This is even user space, or this is the hardware does this. Then we put our own stack, um, actually, let me go back. Then we put our own register state, and then we call this guy. But if we want to go to foo and emulate it, we need to put a return address on the stack as well. So you see the problem here? Where we need to put the return address, it's exactly where the hardware had put its own stack address. So it's not just trace events that are a problem. Uh, we could have, if we have, um, when you register a single callback to one of the function tracing, it will call a, your trampoline directly. What happens is if I say I want to do function trace on a single function, it'll create dynamically a trampoline and call that. And so it's all doing direct calls. There's no indirect calls. It'll create a trampoline that calls your callback directly. And then it'll have the tramp, uh, the, what's it called, the no-op at the beginning of the function, like your trampoline, I'll call your, your trampoline and then do whatever you want. Then if you say you have two functions, and one calls tramp one and one calls tramp two. But now you want tramp them both to call tramp two. So you actually now you want to switch it, but you don't want to ever have a uh, no op there. So the, translation, the transition between those two states is no longer function to no op, it's from function to function. The no op is not in the state transition. So it's, it's the same problem as we had with the uh, function call before. But do we care about function tracing? Yes, because have you ever heard of live kernel patching? It's a big thing that, yep, live kernel patching is something that is used by Red Hat and Suzy, KGraph to Suzy, K patches in um, uh, Red Hat. It's big in their systems. They, what it does is basically you have these uh, high availability systems, so it's doing a lot of um, running. You, can never, you can't shut down the machine, but then you find one of these major bug reports or bug, bug issues and you fix the code, and the only way to fix the kernel is, is, is if you reboot the kernel. So what they do is actually make another function, load it into memory, and then chain, make it call this guy. How do they do that? With ftrace. So remember how we have the call? They have a live patch trampoline that ftrace will, call, will go up there and we call the live patch trampoline. And when it basically, it calls its live patch call, which changes the instruction pointer, 
Remember I said before, the breakpoint just goes past on the return, we just make it skip. The, uh, the breakpoint handler just makes it skip. Well, the ftrace handler will actually have the return jump to a new function. So say if the scheduler is broken and you have a new scheduler, it will load the schedule fix program in there. When the scheduler is hit, it will jump to the trampoline and then when return back from that trampoline to the other uh, schedule fix, so this, or the buggy scheduler code never runs. But let's say we want to trace the scheduling as well. If we want to trace the scheduler, it's going to change to a generic trampoline that's going to call our loop function that's going to loop between uh, the tracing as well as the five patch code there. But you see, we went from calling a fixed bug to a generic trampoline. But if we were to do the breakpoint handler between that, you'll see we just call, we, went, we return back to the buggy scheduler. So during this transition, we're going to run buggy code. So we can't do that. We have to make we have to go from the, tramp, the live patch trampoline to the generic trampoline. So, solution number one. So, it's to have, this, someone came up from the live patch people, I think it was a Susie group, notice this. So, let's see. In fact, actually I've studied all the other ones, I forgot this one because this is the one that we, didn't throw, we threw away. Oh yeah, that's right. They had a per task, well, we had a, basically a per task descriptor with different levels you're in, whether you're in normal level, soft IRQs, hard IRQs, or NMIs. That's because uh, when you're in normal context, you can get preempted by the soft IRQ, which can be preempted by the hard IRQ, which can be preempted by NMIs. So we had this stacked up. It got really ugly and stuff like that. But anyway, um, the way it would work is you jump in, you jump to this, uh, we return to this special trampoline that would then uh, do some case, don't care about this because really, Linus hated it and so did everyone else. So we just threw that out. Forget about that one. Solution two, what if we could just move the stack? So remember I said we had that problem with the stack was there? So instead of doing this and have the stack frame, we would actually move the stack frame at that point before we called the handler. This way, the handler could just put in the return address, and when we return, we're, we're right there, and then we have the return address. Simple solution. Very simple. We all loved it. Um, but there was a problem with 32-bit. The 32-bit Intel does something different. 64-bit, uh, remember, it stores everything in our old, the old stack pointers right there. Well, 32-bit, because back then you wanted to save stack and old, you didn't have much memory. So remember, 32-bit goes way back to almost the original Intel, the i386. Um, it didn't have a stack pointer. The stack pointer was right actually at the, um, it just left the stack pointer. Since it says, OK, you just know that when you had the exception, you just subtract something so you would see where the old pointer is. So if you want to see where the, the stack pointer was, was for the task that was running, you have it, you just offset it. You can look at the offset from where you came in, entered, where you entered into the handler. The problem with this is if you, um, what's it called? So, I wanna make sure, yeah. On 30, on 64 bit, to get the stack pointer, remember you get that red, the regs uh, descriptor that you can modify the instruction pointer. You also have uh, access to the stack pointer and there's a lot of cases you want to read the stack pointer as well to see where you came from. Uh, if you want to do a backtrace or whatever. So on x86 or 64-bit you'll see that all you have to do to get the stack pointer was you read the regs indirect pointer of SP. But if you're on 32-bit and you do this, say if you had on the old stack 1 and then you went to go read the stack pointer Stack pointer equals one. Worse yet, if it's an unallocated page, so basically there could be times where you could actually take an exception with that where your stack hasn't even been allocated yet and there's nothing there. If you actually were to try to read the stack pointer from kernel space, you actually crash the machine. And this actually has happened when people forgot to do this. So you can't do that. We actually have to, add, we actually have to read the address of the stack pointer to get the stack pointer. So there's two ways of getting the stack pointer in x86, depending on whether you're 32-bit or 64-bit. So we have a macro that wraps this, and this is one of the biggest causes for bugs 
that go on for, that's been going on forever. Because every too often you'll see a crash, and that's because someone was developing on 64-bit, forgot to wrap this how to access a stack, stack pointer, and when 32-bit ran, it crashed. So what we want to do is when we take the int3, like I said, we're going to make it work for the same both times. We're going to actually, since we have to move the stack frame anyway, hey, why not on the 32-bit code move it and put the stack pointer information so now we get rid of that hack throughout the kernel and make it look really, really nice. Here's the problem. Everyone loved it. We got great reviews from everyone. Linus was absolutely against it. So, what do we do? I think the reason why he was against it is this was the last remaining code from 1991. We were getting rid of his baby. And he was dead set against us from doing this. Uh, like I said, this is really, really old code. And, ah, uh, and because we, we, we didn't realize this, because we're all going, why is. You know, why is Linus being such a hard head on this? I mean, this is, it's obviously this is a good solution. And the solution he came up with, not so good. So he wanted these per CPU variables again. This is almost like the first patch. And so what it required was we had to make a special trampoline for every synth type of context we were kind of in. Uh, we had to make a trampoline whether we had interrupts enabled, and we had to make a trampoline whether we didn't have interrupts disabled. And I think the funny part is Linus seemed excited about this hack because it was really a hack. Uh, the way this looked was that in your in you had to check to see if you were in an NMI and you used one trampoline. If you weren't in an NMI, you had to see if interrupts were enabled and you used another trampoline. If you were not if you were in another NMI, you were in, in another trampoline. And what the trick was is that you had to jump to a trampoline to, so basically, remember the stack frame there? Well, when you returned back to the trampoline, you actually had, st you're, you're returning back to a trampoline, now you got rid of the hardware stack frame, and then you could do, this trampoline could add the return address onto your stack frame, so you had to use a per CPU variable of where your stack is, jump to this guy. Now, if interrupts were enabled when you, this happened, if you jump back, an interrupt could come in and screw everything up for you. So what he said was, well, when the exception happens, it automatically disables interrupts. So what you do is you return back to the trampoline with, and keeping the interrupts disabled. So you, you modify the flags bit to say, OK, jump back with interrupts disabled still, and then modify your flag or modify uh, the stack, and then enable interrupts from this trampoline, and then jump back. He thought this was better. So, this is the, what the trampolines looked like. You had enable calls and stuff like that. Well, Linus obviously liked it. Everyone else hated it. It had locked up problems. It interacted, if, if we have shadow stack that's coming soon to prevent uh, stack corruptions. Where it's a hardware feature, stuff like that, that you actually can create a shadow stack, and if, you, if anything ever modifies a stack without doing it a normal way, uh, using, you know, if there's a bug, a, something like a, uh, usually a lot of times you'll have a lot of security features done by uh, array overflows, where you go off by one bugs, or you overflow, you usually get into the stack, modify the stack, and do something different. Uh, there's, the hardware is going to do a shadow stack, if anything like this modifies the stack, it will give a fault, so you wouldn't be able to do these things. So that's exactly what this is doing, this is kind of like, uh, tricking the stack, so we'd have to, there are ways around it, but it's going to be complicated that way when that comes. Linus's answer was, we'll deal with it when it comes to it. Um, and then we had to have a tra uh, three trampolines for every time we did it. And, and, and the thing was, Linus said, I'm not going to take your solution two until you do solution three. So I actually worked really, really hard implementing solution three to make sure Linus would be happy with it, even though I hated it, and I was hoping the other solution would go, which was the first time I ever worked really hard on code, I was hoping the other solution would win. And, but the thing is, I couldn't even you know, say, okay, slip this in, because Linus was analyzing it, and Linus is damn smart. So if I tried to do anything to trick it, he, then he wouldn't trust me. So I had to keep his trust 
So I really tried hard to make it, and I even asked him for advice. I'm like, I'm stuck here, can you help me? He came back and helped me with it. So I got it all working good. And finally, when we put the two up, what's it called? Uh, he finally said, yes, number two was better, because the code was so horrible. No matter how hard I tried to make it look good, it was just so bad compared to solution three. But he wasn't done yet. He came up with solution four. Ah, oh, so only modify the in three. He says, you know, let's keep, it's only in three that's our issue. Let's just modify that. Basically, he was trying so hard not to modify 32-bit code. He started to make the 64-bit code look worse. So what he wanted to do was, instead of this little trick where we had, remember we had this issue where we, got, we have the flags on 32-bit? He said, let's put extra space after the flags, and then when we... Uh, do our do it, we have two, we have a special do int three caller, and it would return, what's it called? It would return the, uh, basically the regs that was passed to it back, and then that's what it would change the stack to. So when we wanted to emulate a um, system call, it would return, it would actually do it, the call that would be happening would be, but for, wow, let me go back. Yeah, let's see here. Yeah, so when you call do in three, you had the handler move the stack frame, not the C code, or not the assembly code. The assembly code, before we had the assembly code move it, before we called the C code, he's having the C code move the stack frame, come back, and now we could return and change our call stack to jump back. Now we're here, and we go back. Again, Linus obviously loved this approach. Don't worry if you don't really understand it. It was really, really ugly, but it was... Um, Linus loved this approach, but I said to him, you know, you just really made, it just put all this ugliness into the x86 64-bit uh, kernel. Why, I'm like, I said to him, why are we putting all this ugly code into the 64-bit kernel? We're putting all this ugly code into the kernel or into the architecture of the future to maintain the architecture of the past. So where do we end up? Well, x86, I said, we're not doing that. Uh, he finally said, fine, okay, it's okay with the 64-bit uh, code. And uh, the 32-bit was still not imp implemented, so we may just let it die. But this isn't true. Actually, something did happen. I found out this week, I was talking to Peter Zilstra, who was, implement was the one implementing the other code, and he said he finally convinced Linus to our solution. How? The diff stat. If you know what diff stat means, how much lines code you added, deleted, or changed, the diff stat of solution two had all this deleted code. The diff stat of his solution added a lot of code. And one thing Linus has been saying, he just said it now, I really love deleted code. So when he got to the point we showed him the diff stats, he finally went, okay. <laughs> now, it basically showed it was him accepting that he, he's, he was fighting because of his personal belief, which to me, it shows Linus is, is, is a human. We all have our code that we love. I'd say code is art. It's a reflection of ourselves. And down this, this is, like I said, the last remaining bits of code that he wrote from 1991. I mean, it's been there forever, and he just didn't want to let it go. I can't blame him. But he couldn't come up with a technical you know, the brilliant Linus Travals could not come up with a technical answer to beat Solution 2. Thank you. All right, so um, not so often you get such a deep insight into how the Linux internals actually work and what it is to implement them. And maybe there are engineers here who would like to ask questions. Um, do we have time maybe, now? Or, do we have time now? Or, yeah. If we have time now, or, or we, we can move back, either yeah. one. Maybe we have five minutes now. So if there is a question that somebody wants to ask in front of everybody else, and there is to go to one of these microphones, please do so. And afterwards, uh, Steve is going to be around for mm -hmm. more questions right over there in the 
room D, where is the lecture's corner. So, have you got intermediate questions now? Did anyone understand anything I talked about? <laughs> Raise your hand if you understood. <laughs> hey, okay. Uh, <laughs> Some people. I hate to say this. Raise your hand if you had yeah. no idea what I talked about all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so don't be shy. Maybe, maybe you may ask a question that is not purely technical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Of course. Okay. So we give another chance to it. Is there anyone willing to daring to? <laughs> Go ahead and ask this person who obviously wrote a lot of code that you guys, all of you, use. And if you don't have a question, you can just say thank you for your code, which is, still makes sense. Okay, so who's gonna dare? That's okay. Okay, come on. He <laughs> dared to come in front of you with the chance of not you being able to understand. By the way, a bit of it. Yeah. this is my fifth talk this week. I gave. I gave four. Okay. At, uh, so I gave. it takes <laughs> an effort. So you make an effort. Good. Okay, we have one. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if this makes sense, but uh, does this somehow affect the Actually, bugger performance? Actually, put your mouth a little bit away from the mic because you're you're yeah. getting distorted a little bit. Uh, does this somehow affect like uh, the bugger performance, like uh, for example, jumping to breakpoints? Like oh, wait, you're saying does the uh, breakpoint thing have a performance penalty on this? Yeah. No, uh, it won't, it won't, all the things, will, okay. Um, let me take that back. If we move, do the shift, it's going to be a slight performance, it will be a slight hit of the, the exception handlers. We'll take a slight hit for that shift, but it's going to be within the noise. I mean, yes, there is an overhead, depending on that, page faults may be, because it'll affect page faults, it'll affect every single, um, uh, what's it called? It affects all exceptions, which includes page points. It's a slight change because we moved it, but you're only, we're moving the stack frame before we re, uh, store the registers. So it's only a little bit, but it cleans up the code between the two arcs a, a lot. It actually we're able to make things a little bit easier. So there's some parts, it's one of those things, it makes it a little bit more expensive here, faster over here because we don't need to deal with two different ways of handling the same uh, functionality. So yes and no. Thank you. May, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, if I understand a bit of assembly and all what the registers are, 64-bit, 32-bit, if I know a bit of C and I've read through some of the kernel code, is there a way to approach you guys that from our perspective you're somewhere high in the skies like shining stars, is there a way to approach you and to contribute and to help with this development or even to learn and to get involved in some way? Because my, like, uh, my sixth sense is that there may be people in this room or probably people watching this um, topic and they say, wow, this is so cool, like these people do such a cool stuff. How, to, how can I start be doing this? Uh, well, there's three people in this room that I talked to earlier that are going to be, I'm not, yeah, they're not going to point them out, but they're going to be shining stars. They'll be up here in 10 years. Um, hmm. So uh, yes, come with me and I'll come, say some of the things I told them. Linux Weekly News that, um, net, LWN net is a great news source to know everything else. It's cheap, it's easy to go to. Try to find local communities there. Read the, if you want to know about Linux kernel, go on the videos. Kernel recipes, I, those, uh, the videos I showed you, there's awesome talks that start from low to high. And most of these people, like, uh, I mean, just kind of have to read, like Linux Weekly News, find things there, and eventually, uh, if you look in the, at the kernel and you find a bug, report a bug and report it directly to the person who wrote it. If you do find anything, you say, look, I found a bug here. If you find a stack trace and do, gate, like if you ever run a bug in, or ever run the kernel and you see a stack trace, uh, the code inside, the stack trace will show you functions. And if you run those functions, like uh, look in the kernel, you might be able to find who wrote that code. Send that person an email saying, hey, uh, I found this bug and it has your code in it. They might tell you it's not mine, it's theirs. Mm. But then you send the other person there, just listen to it. Then you, that's, they're so going to. It's not that scary. It's not that scary to get. No, to it's get not scary at all. I was just telling, what I told the people was um, when I first started here, I was you. Okay. I was no different. In fact, I even said to someone, I, my first, I worked Red Hat when I first joined, I said, I don't, I don't think I keep compete with these people. And the person said, come on, come on in, and in five years, you'll be one of them. Hmm. So, so I'm it in the exact take, same. Like, a lifetime. It, uh, it just takes uh, perseverance of some kind. Yeah, and, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm only here because of all of I've done before. Mm -hmm. So if you have an interest and a, a passion, okay. that's the two things: I, interest and passion. Okay, and it's possible. 
Anything's possible. Maybe another question. Okay, so as far as I understand, uh, these steps that, uh, that are before the functions in the, in the kernel, they only appear uh, in front of systems, system calls, right? Uh, no, uh, it's not. It's all functions. All functions. Those no obsolete all functions. And if you enable, if I, I could even, if you want to go back there, I can show you a quick demo. If you were to go into as root and you mount a bugfs or a tracefs directory, there's a directory. You just echo function into this file, and then you can see all the functions that are going on inside the kernel on your laptop right now. Okay, uh, and is this something that GCC does? So it's a GCC feature. It's not something that's in the. Yes, the dash pg dash mf entry does that. And it does it for every function in your code? Uh, every non-inline function, that's, uh, there's things in the kernel that we actually turn it off for because it has some issues. So there's things that we actually turn it off for. So it's not all the functions. But the last time on my laptop that I had, it was uh, 50,000 functions that did it to within the kernel. Yep. Good. Any other questions? Maybe someone? All right, I have one more then, okay. if, if that's OK. Um, the work that you did for this mitigation, was it sponsored in some way? Because obviously the work that Intel did to put Spectre in the processor was sponsored, uh, more or less. Was the work that you and your fellow programmers and the people on the current developers uh, group, was it sponsored somehow by, uh, let's say, I don't know, VMware or maybe Red Hat or somebody else? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, VMware pays me. I mean, I am an employee of VMware. This work I'm doing is all copyright VMware. So my work is, you know, VMware lets me do this. So I work on it. And it has nothing to do with helping VMware. VMware knows that helping the community, the open source community, is going to help them back. So I'm just out there to help it out. Uh, we had a Red Hat person doing something. We have someone from Google working on this. We have someone from Intel working on this. And we, I think we have someone, um, I forgot, from one of the banks. You know, the security actually, so there's some people that are working on this that they don't even tell me who their employee, employer is. Okay, so basically it's a work that results in open source software, but is backed by the industry. Uh, it's the open source community, which is not, in the old days it used to be mostly volunteers, okay. people who did it on their own time. Uh, now companies are realizing that they need to make sure that this works well. Uh, basically, Spectrum, you heard how scary Spectrum Meltdown is. And Linux is, runs on uh, Apple, or sorry, Apple, the Android, and um, uh, all these machines, and banks. Banks and use Linux, and Raspberry, and, uh, like, yeah, those, the banks, everything else. And you saw how easy it is, well, not really easy, but you could read passwords yeah. and private information because of the hardware. So obviously, uh, a lot of effort was done from a lot of the community because we need to close these uh, holes. And the sad part is, this line of attack is new, and people are finding out more and more ways. So it's going to be something that's going to haunt us. The specter will haunt us for a long time to come. OK, so was it really, in your opinion, a design mistake or uh, something that was overlooked or put there on intent to be able to be exploited? Because oh, no, you did, no, no. You did it, a lot of work, and there are, of course, some conspiracy theories that I've been hearing that you know all the Intel books were intentionally left there. No. the. Um, Obviously not. I think what it is is the fact that uh, a lot of designs today are all, well, you know, f to make things fast. And now that you have SMP and uh, multiprocessors and stuff like that, you, it's a problem with performance versus security. If you want to be really secure, turn off your cache. But now you're going to have a machine that runs like the 64 or you know, Commodore 64 back in the day. Okay. <laughs> so it's all these tricks. You got to do all these little tricks to get your machine faster, and that just happens to open up the door for things that people are like. Oh, I didn't think about so that. Complexity. It's the complexity. Yes. For it. Okay, and one last, and then we go to yeah. the next session. So, would it make sense to say that link time optimizations make even more sense now that every function? Uh, yes, because we're doing that. There's a lot of link time optimizations. The whole kernel's filled with link time optimizations. Okay. So, so without yes. those, I suppose it's going to be even worse than these uh, 10, 15 but, percent or so. Yeah, but the link, t link time optimizations help for speed up, but it doesn't solve these bugs. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, Tim, and a great insight. Thank you. Thank you.